everyone and welcome to the 2023 Pollinator Power Party happening during Pollinator Week. My name is Kelly Bills and I'm the Executive Director of Pollinator Partnership. And I am Jessica Fox and I'm with the Electric Power Research Institute. And Pollinator Partnership is a nonprofit organization based in San Francisco, California. We actually started and initiated Pollinator Week 17 years ago. We are a group that works to prom promote and protect all pollinator species across North America. And EPRI um, is a nonprofit research institute, and we work with electric power companies around the world, really on any topic that intersects um, either generation, distribution, or use of electricity. And power companies own and manage, have, have a lot of land that they have oversight for. Um, and so I've been working for 20 years actually with these companies to think about the relationship to water and habitat and biodiversity. And um, just super excited to now lead the Power and Pollinator Initiative, which is the largest initiative in the world um, that uh, helps electric power companies think about the relationship to pollinators. So we have a good lineup for you this year in the content for the party. So on Monday, we're gonna start with um, thinking about the status of pollinators, and it'll be um, really the first um, public update since the 2007 National Academy of Sciences study. Um, and one of the lead authors and contributors to the 2007 study is gonna be giving us our, our update that's focused on the ecology um, and kind of what's going on with pollinators out in the ecosystem. And then when Wednesday, the live stream is going to focus on solutions. So going from current status to now, what do we do about it? Um, and thinking particularly about um, getting more done at once um, in the face of climate change and this clean energy transition. So is it possible to both um, achieve a greenhouse gas goal with clean energy and support pollinators at the same time? And we have some really interesting conversations, including um, the Undersecretary of USDA is going to be speaking on Wednesday. Um, and then Friday, we're going to transition into a really interesting discussion about um, whether bees feel and do they get happy or sad um, and this conversation about what does that mean in terms of implications for how we manage land and habitat if um, bees and insects and invertebrates have an emotional response to what's going on in, in their system. So we have a really interesting week um, for Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, we have some special things planned. Yes, so on Tuesday and Thursday, we're putting the party in your hands, and we've provided you with tons of resources on our websites so that you can uh, download free activity ideas, um, recipes, art, nature walks, really sky's the limit in terms of how you can participate this week during Pollinator Week. So get out in your community and be sure to tell us and share on social media what you're doing in your local community and we'd love to hear and follow along. Yeah, because it would be sort of silly if Kelly and I were having a party by ourselves. <laughs> we could <laughs> so, do it. We but. could do it. Okay, Jessica, are you ready to roll? Ready to roll with our 2023 Pollinator Power Party. Share with us on social media so Kelly and I aren't standing here partying by ourselves. Obscure pollinator is the flower fly, Cirphidae. Most people probably know how to spot bees in their gardens and local parks, but nature is deceiving and full of mimics, and one group of pollinators, flower flies, are especially good at this deception. These flies are bee mimics whose appearance is used to protect themselves from predators and sometimes adopting behaviors of their original bee inspirations. One of these mimics, Aristalis tenax, or the drone fly, looks so much like a honeybee that it even has a similarly hairy body like a honeybee, enough to be an effective pollinator of many plants. Flower flies are not only important pollinators, but also play a key role in biocontrol, as the larvae of many species feed on crop-damaging aphids. So how do you tell the difference between a bee and a flower fly? 
Bees have four wings, while flower flies have only two, along with shorter and stubbier antennae. However, their eyes are much larger, covering most of their head. With nearly 900 species of flower flies in North America, these pollinators are hard to miss. In New York City, we face a lot of challenges, right? There's 10 million people, five boroughs, waterways all around. There's a lot of concrete, there's a lot of buildings. There's not, when you first look at it, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of space to grow food, to, to plant things. Bees pollinate every one out of three bites of food that we take. So they're incredibly important for the food that we eat every day. The way that we're increasing our urban sprawl, there's less forage or less food for the bees. City Grow is responsible for maintaining community gardens and educating school children about the importance of pollinators, rooftop gardens. We're really grateful to Con Edison, truly. Um, Con Ed was one of our very first funders, our longest term funders. Con Edison manages about 8,000 acres of right-of-way that goes underneath our transmission lines. That's between us and our sister company, Orange and Rockland. So what we're proactively doing is planting pollinator habitat, and fostering a low growth community in these areas because that's a real compatible dual use. So when you get to New York City, it presents its own unique challenges because you can't have these big towers as they get to a densely populated area. The agriculture here has to be very, very innovative. And we're lucky to work in the spaces like these, Brooklyn Grange Farm, where um, folks have come up with innovative designs for growing food on roofs. Pollinators are a part of everything we do at City Growers, everything we teach. Um, we have a track record of folks coming through City Growers and becoming beekeepers. <laughs> I've always had a real interest in the natural world. My uncle is actually a beekeeper and sells his honey. But in particular, when I came to City Growers, kind of the bread and butter of what we teach is about pollination and the important role that that has in the food that we eat. We might not like to see a dandelion, but for a bee in early spring, that could be the difference between living and getting back to their hive in one piece and dying right there on the lawn. So studies have shown that smaller community gardens or smaller pollinator gardens, that regardless of the size, will attract butterflies, bees, and other pollinating insects. So it doesn't matter if your backyard is a 10 by 10. If you produce a successful pollinator garden back there, it will have an effect, especially in an urban environment. Of course, our urban environment just doesn't have a whole lot of flowers or fruit and vegetables or forage for the bees. So that's part of why our pollinator pathways are so important. Pollinator pathways are little pockets of food or like it says in the title, little pathways throughout either an urban or a suburban landscape where the bees have forage or food. The same way that we can walk a few blocks in New York and find a bodega or a grocery store or even a fruit stand, we want the same experience for our bees. For pollinator pathways, I think about planting flowers and, and things that the pollinators can forage from, things that they can pollinate, and making sure there's, it's sort of a lot of different space to pollinate throughout the city so there aren't any zones where there's nothing there. Honeybees are not native to the US. They were introduced maybe 400 years ago by European settlers. Honeybee hives are really important, I think, in that they contain a very high number of pollinators. There can be 40 to 80,000 honeybees in one hive. To install a hive, you get a package of bees. They're in a little mesh container and you have a jar of sugar syrup. You also have a queen. The queen bee is the most important. She is the, the bee who will lay all of the eggs in the hive. So she is actually in a small cage with a couple attendant worker bees and it is capped with a small candy cork, like a rock candy. What you wanna do is you wanna remove your sugar syrup, you wanna remove your very important queen, and you wanna flip over that box and you wanna smack the bees out. Um, they're lighter than gravity, if you can believe it, so it doesn't hurt them to just pop them into what's called a Langstroth hive. The 
these will all kind of go in, they'll recognize it's a home, and you want to put that, that tiny cage, you want to put that via a rubber band into one of the frames, and the bees will start to eat at that sugar, that rock candy, and they will eat through on both sides, the attendants on the queen side and the worker bees on the other side. It'll take them two or three days to eat through that, and by that time they will recognize the queen's scent and accept her as their own. Worker honeybees have a lot of power within the hive. If they don't like the queen bee, or if they don't recognize her scent, they will kill her. It's really natural for, to have that instinct to be afraid of a bee. We all know that bees sting. So what we do is, uh, at City Growers is try to teach the young people why bees sting and that they really don't want to sting you. It's their last resort and bees do die when they do sting, honeybees do. Bees for kids and perhaps kids in New York City in particular can be scary. I think it's really natural for kids to be afraid of them, to maybe even want to kill them and for them to think of bees as nothing to do with pollination or the food that we eat. What we do is sort of teach them all the work that they're doing. They're really just trying to pollinate. If a bee lands on you, it's because you probably smell good or you're wearing a beautiful color, so it's actually a great compliment. To expose them to bees on the farm, I think is really important in lessening that fear and it's kind of a pathway to learning more about our environment and green jobs, and nature in particular. Queen bee. Queen bee. Worker bee. Worker bee. Drone bee. Drone bee. If pollinators, specifically bees, were to become extinct, that would be kind of a grim world. We could survive, but we wouldn't be at our best, and our ecosystem wouldn't be at its best. We would have less flowers, less fruits, less birds. Without the bees, it's kind of a trophic cascade where it all comes crashing down. I mean, I think best case scenario is that we uh, equip young people with tools and resources to sort of understand how to um, help their ecosystems thrive and how to take care of the pollinators. What I really think about is if the founders of Brooklyn Grange Farms can think up a crazy idea like having a farm on a roof, the young people who come here with all of their creative ideas, just imagine what they can think of being inspired by a place like this. As an energy company, you know, we think about uh, the utilities that we use in the city and we're all familiar with, with Con Ed and um, seeing Con Ed give back in this way to help um, the environment, help the ecosystem, help the pollinators by contributing to nonprofits that are doing, doing the work um, is really special in a funder. The biological world that we're living in has many issues. It's being impacted by land use changes, pollution, climate change. Our goals are really to combat that. Biodiversity preservation, as some have said, is the opposite side, the other side of the coin of climate change. Because you can't really solve climate change without solving the biodiversity problem that's been impacting us. Hello, I'm David Inoue. I'm a researcher at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory and also Professor Emeritus at the University of Maryland. And I'm happy to have the opportunity to speak with you today. And the topic that I'm going to discuss is the status of pollinators, and in particular, how pollinators are doing since 2007. The reason that I've picked 2007 is that that's the year that a report was published. This report 
uh, was published by the National Research Council, uh, written by a committee on the status of pollinators in North America. And that project was uh, uh, initiated by the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. Uh, the committee consisted of uh, May Berenbaum as chair, uh, a re researcher from Mexico, Rodrigo Medellin, uh, a researcher from Canada, Peter Kevin, and then a group of people from institutions around uh, North America, around the United States. The topic of that book is the importance of pollinators, the, uh, and we split that into managed pollinators and wild pollinators. And we just dis discussed their status, the causes for their decline, the consequences of decline, uh, what's involved in monitoring, and also conservation and restoration of native pollinators. And a big problem that we found at that time was that there was uh, actually very little information available about most pollinators. Uh, the best information we could find was for managed honeybee po uh, populations, but uh, for wild pollinators, there is a great paucity of information. We have 4,000, uh, roughly 4,000 native bees, for instance, here in the United States, and very little is known except for maybe a few of those. Well, what's happened since then? Uh, in, there have been a number of scientific papers that have addressed uh, this problem. Uh, here, example, is a paper that was published on the global trends in the status of bird and mammal pollinators from 2015. The uh, Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, IPBES, uh, published a, an assessment report on pollinators, pollination, and food production at the global scale. And I was uh, lucky to be a, a, a participant in that report. In 2017, a, an edited book was published about pollinators in peril that addressed North American and Hawaiian native bees. The European Union's uh, Court of Auditors published a special report on protection of wild pollinators in the EU and unfortunately concluded that many of the initiatives that were underway have not yet had a very important effect. There have been some modeling studies, including this one from 2015, modeling the status, trends, and impacts of wild bee abundance in the United States. Uh, here's a paper on the spatial and temporal trends in the economic value of biotic pollination services in Georgia from 2021. A review article about insects in general, not just pollinators, but looking at their biodiversity, threat status, and conservation approaches from last year. There've also been a number of video presentations that are now available on the web. Uh, here are two examples, one about facts about bees from the Natural History Channel, uh, another one that's available on YouTube. And although the title is The Secret Success Behind Honeybees, uh, there's actually a lot of information about uh, bumblebees in that video. So it's well worth watching. Another big change since 2007 was the establishment of a native bee inventory and monitoring lab as part of the United States Geological Survey based in Patuxent, Maryland at the Eastern Ecological Science Center. And the goals of that center are to design and develop large and small scale surveys for native bees. And uh, they've helped to develop a protocol, for instance, for using pan traps and can point to what are the best ways to handle the large numbers of insects that you're likely to be collecting with pan traps. And as part of that program, they've also developed identification tools and keys for native bee species. Uh, some of those uh, 4,000 native species here in the United States. And one aspect of creating those tools was to uh, create a library of photographs, very high, high scale, uh, high resolution uh, photographs and Sam Drogi in particular has been in charge of that operation. Those are freely available on the internet. Another uh, significant change since 2007 was the creation a few years ago of a research uh, network, a research coordination network funded by the US Department of Agriculture. Uh, the PI on that is Hollis Woodard at UC Riverside. 
but there's uh, quite a list of participants you can see here. Uh, and we published a paper describing uh, the efforts that we were making towards a US national program for monitoring native bees. Uh, there's a website that you can go to with uh, information about the workshops that we've held. I think there are recordings of those workshops available now. Uh, a number of resources for people interested in native bees and an update on where we are where we are with uh, our progress towards creating uh, recommendations for how to monitor native bees. The North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, or NAPSI, has played a role here. Uh, its working group on bumblebees uh, wrote a, a white paper that addressed the problem of diseases that have been spread around the world now through the commercial bumblebee trade. Uh, and uh, we summarized in three papers that are now available freely on the Journal of Poll Pollination Ecology, one about uh, what are the parasites, parasitoids, and hive products that are potentially deleterious uh, to bumblebees here in North America, what are the endosymbionts that threaten commercially raised and wild bumblebees, and unfortunately there's been a lot of transmission uh, of diseases from the commercial uh, bumblebees to the wild bumblebees. And then the third paper in the series was an evidence-based rationale for a North American commercial bumblebee clean stock certification program. And we're optimistic that uh, potentially the USDA sometime in the, in the future will uh, create this clean stock certification program uh, that will help to regulate the commercial bumblebee trade. Another change that's occurred since 2007 is the creation of a number of uh, state level web pages about pollinators. So here's the, an example for the state of Vermont. Here's their web page on the status of trends of wild insect pollinators. Here's an example from Minnesota, their web page about pollinators and uh, pollinator habitat. An example from Texas about native pollinators and private lands, how to target effective and efficient pollinators and an example from Iowa. And that's not an exhaustive list. Many, many states now have uh, such state level web uh, resources about uh, things that you can do to help conserve pollinators in your state. I wanna switch gears a little bit now and talk about some of the work that we're doing at a particular site, the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory in Southwest Colorado. Those of you that are skiers may have heard of the Crested Butte Ski Area. Uh, which is uh, the mountain shown here. The East River Valley, which is on the backside of Gothic Mountain, is where the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory is located. And that lab is at 9,500 feet in the West Elk Mountains, surrounded on three sides by national forest and by uh, grazing lands on the, on the other side. It's a very busy place this time of year. There are 180 residents studying uh, the ecology of the plants and animals at 9,500 feet in the Rocky Mountains. And many of those plants and animals that are being studied are being looked at through the lens of pollination biology. I want to give you a couple of examples of wildflowers uh, that are floral resources and what we've learned about them and uh, also about the pollinators that visit them. This is the aspen sunflower, a, a wildflower that I've studied for over 50 years now. And it's an important resource for uh, wild bees, including bumblebees, some solitary bees, and even flies that come to eat pollen or collect nectar from these wildflowers. It can be very common. Here's a meadow full of, oh, probably hundreds of thousands of these flowers in the middle of July. Uh, and that's probably what it's going to look like next month. But if you looked some years, the same site, the same time of year, there are zero flowers available. And so what happened to them? Well, despite the fact that these are long-lived perennials, they are frost sensitive. And so in a year with frost damage, you may end up with a situation like this, where there are, are no flowers and therefore no pollen and no nectar for all those pollinators. I've done an annual count since 1974 and 1975 in two different plots of how many flowers are actually present. And you can see there are a lot of zeros over the years, maybe even becoming more common than they used to uh, because of frost damage killing most or all of the, the flowers. 
Uh, maybe if you look at that uh, a little bit carefully, you'll note that it looks like there's there are three distinct peaks. And I think there are actually are cycles. There's about a 15 year cycle, I think. And that's an indication of the fact that we need long term studies. For instance, uh, to to see one cycle, I needed 15 years to to confirm that that's a cycle. I needed at least 30 years, and even better is uh, the 50 years that I've, I've I've been looking at these wildflowers. Another example of an important resource for pollinators, in this case, a male broad-tailed hummingbird, uh, is the the early larkspur, which is just coming up now, and a little a few of them in bud at the Rocky Mount Biological Lab in the in the first week of June. Uh, but it's also an important resource for queen bumblebees when they come out of their winter hibernation. And here's a long-tongued bumblebee, and she's going to need that long tongue to get to the nectar in the back of this uh, flower, long tube flower. And she's been collecting pollen. I can tell by the color of the pollen on her pollen basket on her hind legs that she's been collecting pollen from these larkspur flowers. And uh, here's a count uh, for the last 22 years showing what's the number of flowers in a permanent plot. And you can see that it is also highly variable from one year to the next. In fact, the maximum number of flowers per flower stalk is strongly correlated with how much snow we got the previous winter. And one concern is that we're starting to get winters with less and less snow, and that's resulting in fl uh, uh, flowering mm. with fewer flowers per flower stalk. So fewer floral resources for the pollinators. The average number of flowers per inflorescence has in fact been declining significantly since I started counting that. And hopefully it's not gonna to get too much lower. We're also doing a general survey of insect abundance here using a malaise trap, sort of like a, a screen tent that captures insects. And we can then count those insects and weigh those insects. And we do this for 48 hours a week throughout the growing season. This is a paper that's just been accepted in the journal Ecosphere, uh, describing long-term declines in insect abundance and biomass at our study site. And you can see the top graph shows the biomass and that's declining and the bottom graph shows the number of insects we count. Uh, uh, the, and that's also declining. And a number of studies in the last decade uh, perhaps a little bit longer, have shown declines, in some cases very strong declines in insect abundance at sites around the world. And one hypothesis that's been offered for those declines is anthropogenic effects like urbanization, uh, like climate change, uh, like the increased use of pesticides or uh, increased use of, of lights at night. And one thing that's concerning to us in the context of our study is that none of those are issues at our study site. There's no agriculture, there are no pesticides, there are no street lights. Uh, we do have the effects of global climate change and we do have the effects of pesticides that are spread around through precipitation or perhaps the effects of microplastics or uh, endocrine disruptors, chemicals that are being spread around the world uh, through precipitation. But uh, it's concerning that we're seeing this decline, even in an undisturbed site. This is a picture from a National Geographic article from April 2023 uh, about the research that we're doing at the Rocky Mount Biological Lab. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Rebecca Irwin, a faculty member at North Carolina State University, uh, who some 15 years ago joined me as part of a long-term study of wildflowers to expand that to look at uh, native bee populations. And she has an altitudinal gradient, including here in what's uh, almost semi-desert at a lower altitude site, uh, uh, sites around the Rocky Mount Biological Laboratory. This is a meadow where we have uh, flowering phenology plots and also at a little bit higher altitude. So we measure a variety of aspects of climate, including the daily snowfall, snowpack, and precipitation temperature and stream flow data, uh, count flowers. We have uh, 50 years of data now for 150 flowering species. We've counted probably close to 6 million of flowers now. And uh, for bees, uh, this is our 15th year looking at uh, the diversity of some 100, well, actually uh, close to 200 species of native bees of the 
thousand species of native bees that are found in the state of Colorado. And uh, they, we do that through pen trapping and also netting. And we have the associated flowering data in those same meadows. I have measured a variety of aspects of uh, bee uh, traits. And we also have the bee specimens themselves. So we're, we have 16 sites at three elevations. Nine of those are near our long-term flowering phenology and flowering abundance plots. They're sampled every two weeks with pan traps like the ones shown in the lower picture here. And then those netted bees are identified and released. And flower abundance and phenology are recorded in the plots that are uh, separate from the flower phenology plots being used right uh, in the bee meadows, but using similar met uh, methods. And that results in a lot of insects. And Becky is probably one of the few people in Colorado who can identify all of those couple of hundred of, of species of bees now. And we've started to do some analysis of those data. And it turns out that bee community shifts uh, are with climate. So there are more small bees in warmer years. And so this uh, graph shows for low, medium, high, and the highest temperatures, uh, where do most of those bee communities in those years fall out? And you can see that they, uh, there is some separation there. And there's a paper that was published last year that describes uh, some of those results. There's the citation at the bottom. Uh, we've also looked at the phenology uh, not only of plants and of insects, but also at our site of mammals, amphibians, and birds. And for all of these species, including the pollinators, uh, if you plot the day of year when you first see them against snowmelt date, uh, the later the snow melts, the later you see them. And that probably makes a lot of sense because the growing season can't start until the snow's gone. Uh, temperature is also an important variable. Uh, if the temperatures are warmer, uh, then we see these events, first sightings of plants, insects, mammals, amphibians, and birds happening earlier. So there's uh, a number of similarities to what's happening in this ecosystem between the plants and the pollinators and also all the other animals. When the snow melted the previous year, it allows us to make a pretty accurate prediction of what the sex ratios of these solitary bees are going to be. And we get a higher female to male ratio following years with later snow melt. And that uh, raises a flag because what we're seeing now is earlier and earlier snow melt, which means that there are more males and fewer females. And uh, that may start to have a significant effect on uh, the populations of some of these native bees in the relatively near future. So climate change could alter uh, bee sex ratios with uh, pretty important consequences for their persistence. So I think uh, in conclusion that pollinators are receiving a lot more attention than they used to. And that's both from scientists, uh, for instance, those uh, working on pollinators at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, but also the general public. And that comes about in part because of all of the attention that's being given them uh, by these uh, state uh, wildlife agencies, by uh, native plant societies, uh, by the National Phenology Network, uh, by organizations such as the Xerces Society that's uh, promoting conservation of invertebrates. Another conclusion is that insect populations are continuing to decline, and that uh, is, of course, a, a, of great concern. There has been some progress made in management, in protection and conservation of pollinator populations. Uh, uh, we have probably lost to extinction here in, in the United States, uh, a species of bumblebee already. It was always a rare species, but it has now uh, not been seen for probably close to a decade. Uh, and uh, there's concern about some other bumblebee species here uh, in the US, some of which have relatively limited distributions and their abundance seem to be declining. Some of the species in the Midwest where the effects of agriculture, including uh, habitat alteration and the use of pesticides are perhaps uh, most pronounced are areas where uh, some of the native bees, including bumblebees, are, are particularly having problems. So uh, what, what uh, reasons are there for optimism? 
Well, the fact that that you're participating in this pollinator power party uh, and are interested in pollinators uh, and presumably in their conservation is part of the solution. So if you haven't already done so, uh, you can think about how you in your own um, lives, let's say in your backyards or in uh, public garden spaces, could help encourage native pollinators by planting the floral resources that they need. Uh, they need flowers uh, that are in bloom throughout their life cycle. Uh, so bumblebees, where I work, for instance, the queens are coming out just after the snow melts. Uh, they need a series of early flowering species to get their colonies started. There's another set of wildflowers blooming during the middle of the summer when the workers are out there collecting uh, pollen and nectar. And then towards the end of the summer, yet another set of wildflowers that are important for providing the resources for the next generation, for the males and the new queens that will overwinter and, and create the next summer's colonies. Uh, and those floral resources are also important for all of those 4,000 species of, of native bees that we have here in, in North America or in the United States. So uh, think about what you can do uh, to help uh, strengthen the wild pollinator populations. Uh, I'll leave it there uh, and end my talk now uh, and be happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. David, thank you for joining us and for your presentation for the party this year. We really appreciate it. Um, you, so you have, you know, you mentioned, you, you know, you have more than 50 years experience here. You have hundreds of, um, of peer reviewed papers and books. Um, so just, you know, if we just kind of talk about what the upshot is right now for pollinators on the status of pollinators, what are your thoughts on that? Are we, you know, are we in, are we in big trouble? Are we doing okay? Um, do you have kind of just your, your professional opinion on kind of where we're at right now? Um, good question. I, I think we're in a, in a, not in a great spot for pollinators, but I think uh, there are some reasons for optimism. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, there is evidence of declines of pollinators uh, as well as insects in general around the world. And that, that's a great concern, partly because we don't know all the causes of those declines. Uh, if, we, if we were sure we knew the causes, that, that would make the solutions easier. Uh, but uh, I think the fact that, that we now know that uh, insects and pollinators in, are, are in decline is a good step forward because that gives us uh, incentive to think about uh, what the problems are and what we can do about them. And uh, as I mentioned in my talk also, I think a number at the, at the state level, uh, we're seeing a recognition of the, the value of pollinators, uh, of the dangers that they face, and people starting to think about, well, what can we do uh, to help the pollinators? So uh, I think all the way from the uh, international to national to uh, to local levels, uh, people have realized that there's reason for concern and are starting to think about th the best ways to address that, either on a personal level or through uh, through policy. Okay, so the typical sort of, you know, what we kind of point to in terms of causes for pollinator decline, you know, habitat loss, um, you know, increasing exposure to chemicals, pollution, pesticides, that sort of thing. And then uh, and climate change. Those are kind of the three kind of big nuggets that we talk about often as causes for decline. Um, do you agree with those, or do you think there's that we're still trying to figure that out? Well, I think uh, you're correct that we we've, we've identified some of the major categories. We don't know all the details, and that makes it uh, a little bit more difficult to to think about uh, both management and policy. Uh, avenues for addressing these 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 concerns. I mean, we, uh, we're starting to get a better handle on what's the effect, for instance, of uh, neonicotinoid pesticides on pollinators because there's uh, so much re uh, research that's already been done and, and is ongoing now looking at how those pesticides affect both the, the foraging behavior and the development and the longevity and the uh, of the foraging behavior of, of pollinators, and as we <clears throat> as we begin to uh, uh, to document those problems and think about how we can address them, it's going to make it easier for uh, for management and policy solutions to uh, to address that that kind of issue. 
And you mentioned in your presentation this um, this complexity of potential um, transfer of viruses and that sort of thing between managed bees, which is typically the honey bee, Apis mellifera, to wild bees. And we know that bumblebees are in decline. That seems like a really complicated thing because honeybees are extremely important for agriculture. Um, but of course, we need we need the wild bees as well. Do you have thoughts on this kind of you know, how are we going to manage for the honeybees that are not a native species to North America and protect these 4,000, you know, species of wild bees? Yeah, that's another issue that's uh, quite difficult. We uh, we do know, for instance, that it's not just uh, commercial honeybees that are putting some of our native pollinators at risk because of uh, disease issues, but also there is now a pretty significant international uh, trade in bumblebees as pollinators. There are a couple of major companies that are raising bumblebee colonies and shipping them out um, many, to many places around the world uh, for use primarily in greenhouses. But uh, it's now been well documented <clears throat> that if you're putting bumblebees in greenhouse for, for pollinating tomatoes, for instance, that there's a pretty good chance that some of those bumblebees are going to end up uh, leaving the greenhouse <clears throat> either through open uh, ventilation openings uh, or other other mechanisms. And uh, it's been documented that those commercial bumblebees uh, can transmit diseases or are transmitting and have transmitted diseases to native bumblebee populations. <clears throat> so uh, it's not just the honeybees, uh, but here again, uh, now that we know about that uh, problem, uh, we're starting to think about ways to address it. So the the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign has a working group on bumblebees, and it has produced uh, some publications about uh, what those disease issues are uh, for transmission from commercial to native bumblebees, uh, and to call for a, a government policy <clears throat> from the from the U.S. government uh, to help to to manage that disease risk. Mm, wow. Okay. Um... So, um, so on Wednesday during the party this week, we're going to be kind of transitioning. You covered kind of the status. Wednesday, we're going to be shifting to, you know, potential solutions and particularly um, focusing on as we go to renewable energy and try to make, a, you know, transition to a clean energy future and of how that relates to pollinators. Um, and that's, that's going to be... Um, that's going to be a, a, a pretty significant, challenging thing as well when you try to cite all of this renewable power, uh, go to low carbon energy, protect pollinators and biodiversity, and try to protect food supply. Um, do you have any thought? I know that's, that's beyond just um, the pollinator piece. It really relates to a lot of different economic um, sectors. Do you have thoughts in general, you know, based on your your lifetime of experience on how can we as society and through politics and economics sort of make these trade-off decisions? How are we going to choose between clean power and habitat and pollinators? Uh, another interesting uh, and somewhat difficult question. Uh, the uh, But that issue is something that I, I've actually had a little bit of experience with in my uh, home county of Delta, Colorado. When last year, the board, uh, the county's board of commissioners, uh, decided to turn down a, an application for a very large uh, solar installation, and one of the reasons that they gave for that was that they were concerned about its effect on agriculture, and that land was actually not not very productive. It was used a little bit for grazing, uh, because it is semi-desert. Um, and they were finally convinced uh, to to approve that partly by the promises from from the developer that they would manage this uh, for grazing by by sheep, I believe it is. And so the, there is a field now uh, called agrivoltaics, which is uh, an attempt to try and uh, use solar power in such a way that it won't conflict um, or to minimize the conflict with. Uh, activities such as agriculture, and so I know that I know now that there's a demonstration project up near Boulder, Colorado, where they're doing uh, they're both growing uh, 
plants for human consumption as, as well as for grazing in amongst uh, the solar panels. And I think they found that those solar panels can actually be beneficial in that they provide shade in areas that are quite hot and dry uh, for some plants that do better under those kinds of circumstances. So I think uh, there are going to be a number of creative solutions that people are going to start implementing for how to minimize the conflicts that will uh, would otherwise be arise through uh, that intersection, as you mentioned, of uh, renewable energy, clean energy, uh, uh, and other human uses such as agriculture. So uh, I think we're, we're making some steps in that direction now to try and uh, minimize those conflicts and find ways in which those multiple multiple uses can coexist. Great. All right, David. Well, thank you so much for taking my questions today. Um, we are going to cover that agrivoltaics topic and co-location more on, on Wednesday during our party. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. You, uh, you, you're, you're just a, a total powerhouse in the space of pollinator research, and we are thankful to have you present to our party this year. Well, thank you. It's been a lot of fun to be able to participate, and I hope it all goes, all goes well. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go into hearing about Bee City USA, which is a program run by Xerces Society, and then we are giving the ball to you um, for Tuesday um, tomorrow to do things in your local um, your local areas and your local communities. So get out and uh, and do whatever inspires you. You could do art or gardening or check in with your with your organizations and companies and do um, share with us on social media so we know what you're up to tomorrow. Okay, and we'll see you back on Wednesday. Have a great day, bye. Mark Twain said the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. For me, my why is Bee City USA. I've been involved with pollinator conservation for more than 20 years. And in all that time, one of the best initiatives that I came across was Bee City USA. When Phil Stiles started it in 2012, I thought it was a fabulous idea to come up with something that local communities can adapt to their own needs, their own creativity, their own desires. Something that will have a true impact on the ground for pollinators. The key to our vision for Big City USA was that cities and individuals and institutions are already landscaping, they're already doing it. But what if they did it in a different way with pollinators in mind? The thing that really has to impact, the thing that is most amazing about it are the people, the communities, the cities, the college campuses, the individuals, the organizations who bring energy and creativity and dedication to the work. We are celebrating our 10 year anniversary with over 300 affiliates in 45 states. From plant sales to movie nights, bioswales to green roofs, affiliates have engaged over a million people in pollinator conservation work and in just the past three years have created over 2,500 acres of pollinator habitat. Their work is what has the real impact, an impact it has had. Thousands of acres of habitat have been created. Many cities are cutting out pesticides. They're also doing outreach, amazing diversity of activities from pub quiz nights to city parades, all sorts of amazing ways to bring people in. Kudos to all those cities and campuses across the country who are making friends for pollinators and helping us retain as much biodiversity as we can on our planet with all the stressors we're facing these days. That optimism and can-do attitude is crucial. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful, dedicated work to protect pollinators in your community. We're so happy to celebrate 10 years with you. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. <laughs>